speakers from your phone. I'll take the mic. Good evening. Um, I think after those brilliant uh, presentations, um, I don't, I'm not too sure whether I can perform as expected. But all the same, um, we're running out of time, so I've put my um, timer on, so I'll speak within the time allocated. Uh, it's um, uh, a pleasure being here, uh, sharing my experience um, with um, uh, uh, participants and those who are connected online. Very briefly, um, I started my development career about 32 years ago. My construction career about 47 years ago. So when I say so in forums like this, people look at me and ask, what's your age? But I'll, I'll leave you to guess. So um, uh, I want to just answer a question that was asked by one of the speakers by saying, why the private sector? The, the same question would have been asked maybe in the late 80s, and it was asked by those, or it was, the question was to bankers and those in the telecommunication sector. Because in the banking sector, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, the lower income earners were never addressed. But today, we all know the answer, the amount of profits that are there. Same thing with telco. I mean, in sub-Saharan Africa, cell phones were, were non-existent around before 1990. But today, we see the figures. So I think that in affordable housing, there is also big profits that's waiting, waiting there for somebody to come up with the answers. And that is why we are interested in this. I'm supposed to speak on green building equals to affordable building. So green and affordable. So how do you do OK, that's um, uh, green, urban, OK. I just flipped through because time is against us. Now, for what, what we are doing is we're trying to develop a million homes across sub-Saharan Africa. Because sub-Saharan Africa is not the same as the Maghreb. There are different countries, and every country is different from the other. Policies are different. Um, the local um, conditions are different. So as you move from one country to the other, things are completely different. Over the past 10 years, we've ventured into Nigeria. I mean, a country that is seen to be very difficult to operate, but we succeeded in building a completely new settlement in Port Harcourt, about 1,200 units. And since then, we have been engaged by governments in developing this. So what we did was, we then ended up now the vision to build a million homes, but in different uh, countries. We have now started building um, green, obviously, because that's now the thing, that you need to build green and be affordable. So in our own small country of the Gambia, with a population of 2.5 million, we are building a city that is twice bigger than our capital city. And we have started. Um, so as I go from the, um, uh, on the slides, it says, you know, what is green building? To us, to minimize resources and uh, maximize uh, reuse, resources, recycling, and urbanization of renewable resources through the following. We look at our designs. Then we look at energy efficiency. We look at, at um, material efficiency, waste, and um, toxic re reduction. Then why do we go green? Some of these we, we know the answers. Um, reduce carbon consumption, energy independence, um, encourage community, and also preserve natural systems. I just want to fast track so that I can now share my example on what we're doing in the Gambia. Then, the tough city. Now, tough city with um, um, green living meets affordability. It's a well-designed and properly master-planned city with over 5,000 homes. Again, just think about 5,000 and a population of 2.5 million. In my own calculations, 
I think that in sub-Saharan Africa, there is a deficit of 10% of our population. So where in Nigeria you have a deficit of about 20 million, then simply pro rata, it means that there's a 120 million housing unit deficit in sub-Saharan Africa. But again, that's an opportunity. So, um, and then in uh, the ranges that we do, we start from two bedroom, three bedroom to four bedroom. They are all gated and fenced in a secure development. Now, the price range is very important. I have once asked about affordability. Let's define affordability. What is affordability? I mean, from one country to the other, they will give you different price range. So what we have done in our own case is to start as low as $35,000. $35,000, and in terms of size, 49 square meters, seven meters by seven meters, two bedroom. Anywhere you go, you will always have complaints that they are small. But put it in the market because there's a deficit. So somebody will pick it up. And that's our experience. So 49 square meters, land size, prior to our own development, land size we are looking at an average of about 300 square meters. We've cut it by half, 180 square meters. We build off plan and there's no house that is not sold. So uh, we start as low as $35,000 and then as high as $180,000. 14 different designs. This was started last year, but now we've cut, in, cut it down to seven. So for me, affordability is what anybody can afford. If you can afford a $35,000 house, that's affordable to you based on your income bracket. And then those who can afford $180,000, we still build for them. What that does also, it's like when you're trying to level land. It's a cut and fill. So our profit margins on the lower end of the market are not as high as those at the, at the top end. Because the smaller the unit, less margins you make. If you want to put two toilets in a 49 square meter building, obviously, is not the same as putting it in a 300 square meter building. So um, uh, now the housing units, 1,500 housing units in the first phase, then 24 hours water and sewage reticulation system, 24 hours solar power, electricity supply, paved roads, 10,000 trees. So what do we do in our development? Again, this is land that is 100% bought by us. Zero intervention by the government. So when we buy, but when we do our master planning, we make sure we avoid cutting down any trees. Actually, we, we do our design as much as possible to save the trees. And then fully smart city, and um, twice, as I said, the size of Banjul. Uh, now, how green is the city? It is located in Sifo and Gunjur, um, and the city is covered by a master plan which will have amenities, facil facilities such as playgrounds, schools, hospitals, health clubs, etc. Within walking distance, which itself makes it green. Um, we do cater for bicycle lanes, um, uh, footpaths, walking, jogging tracks, and so on. Now, the city is strategically located off the city of um, Sifo and Gunjur, on the main highway, and there are plans not to place, in place to partner with local companies. What I also realize in uh, trying to make housing affordable is that we don't, con uh, we don't consider the sustainability bit of it. So, for example, um, whilst working in Nigeria, everybody is clogged around Lagos just building there. So what happened is, okay, while some are now moving to Lekki, you know, which is some few kilometers away, people still commute. So, and that is why we walk on a leave, walk, and play, and that's what the city gives you. So it's, you have your living, education, commercial, and also we have a special economic zone. Because generally in Africa, that's what you find. Any country that you go into, they will put, put a development without these amenities. So it's not sustainable because people will, will pay so much in trying to move between their workplace and where they're living. So mass transit is something that you must consider 
if you want to solve housing you know, and being, make it affordable. These are the facilities that, are, that, that we have there. I will not bore you with it. Now, how green is a tough city? The master plan I have mentioned with all the trees, actually what we do is in any house that has got a backyard, we plant their five fruit trees. So you can imagine, if 5,000 units with five fruit trees is 25,000 fruit trees. Again, sustainability. Um, uh, this, that's the master plan. Where am I? There. I've got five minutes to go. I want to play a video. Then the house designs. Um, uh, Um, house designs at Tough City, each property has at least one veranda or balcony to provide shade and cut winds, which will ensure there is good ventilation, adequate daylight, and throughout the properties. So obviously, when you, when you work on your design properly, that also saves on energy and makes it green. And then uh, vegetation and landscaping externally throughout the estate. There are trees, plants, and lawns around the buildings. There are interlocking pavement which makes the ground green and increase water flow and encourages uh, ventilation. That's a typical example. The building you see here, actually we had to shift our road to save this tree. There was no way we were going to cut this tree. And that is what, what's happening on the land that we are now. Lighting, um, um, solar power, Tough City is solar powered throughout and there is zero power supply in the area as I speak to you now. So we've got about 60 units already done and everything is solar powered. All the water pumps are all solar. All streets lights are solar as I said. Anything currently being done in the city is being powered by solar including the fully, full functioning of our marketing suite. Now, um, how green is tough city, borehole use, water, 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 rainwater collection, wastewater reuse. And at tough city, we are saving water, we, re we reduce, reuse, and then replenish. Now, uh, can green building be affordable? Let's talk about the city again, structural designs we've seen. These are all the details. I've mentioned it before, so let me just move on. We're trying to be edge certified. Actually, tomorrow I have, a, no, on Wednesday I have a, um, a, a meeting, um, a virtual meeting with um, the World Bank, with IFC, and I'm talking to um, uh, uh, the edge, the go those res responsible for edge, to be edge certified. So, so for, me, for us, there's one thing to be certified, but there's another thing to be sustainable. I mean, being certified, edge certified also, gives you um, advantage of uh, accessing green funds. Now, that, let me just see, can they play the video? I might want to do it from here. Or? Anyway, let me just... You know our range. <laughs> but if we don't, I'll just tell you what we're doing now, upcoming projects. Um, okay, all right. So with the upcoming projects, we're now engaging. Sierra Leone wants to do some micro cities, so we're engaged. I think that in the answer for affordable housing and also going green, PPP is the answer. So in Sierra Leone, we're negotiating to um, uh, build some micro cities, and we're starting with the first one. Now, the biggest threat we have as developers is political uncertainty, political continuity. That's for another day, but that's one of our major challenges. You negotiate with the government, and within a period of four years, a whole policy is changed. So we've been negotiating with Sierra Leone for the past two years or so, but elections are next year. So, well, we hope something will happen. Now, Sierra Leone, let me see. Our vision is to develop a million homes, as I said. 
and it started in 2018. We hope by 2038 we will be there one way or the other. And then our goal is to be the leading developer in Africa, but let's say Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, these are the countries that we are registered, but we are very active in Nigeria and the Gambia. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. I think I've done it exactly on 15 minutes, 20 seconds. Thank you.